So GraphQL is a technology to do queries um, in the web environment. It is an open source technology that's widely adopted by now. Uh, that was started in 2015 by Facebook. That's, that's the roots of it. Um, and you can say it plays very nicely, not by accident, with another popular Facebook technology, which is React. So React is sort of standard way to use React is to use GraphQL to have your um, mobile app or web front and talk to an API. And um, you can basically think of GraphQL as an alternative or replacement of REST, which is a very common technology that we all probably have been using for a long time if we work with APIs. And you can basically throw out, or you have to throw out everything you have taken for granted, HTTP status calls, HTTP verbs, all of this doesn't matter. Um, GraphQL is basically throwing overboard the, the, one of the main concepts of REST, which is resource oriented. And it's basically addressing use cases um, that are quite common for many people, which is you want to have a loser connection uh, to resources. So rather than get everything an API knows about a particular resource, um, let's say metadata about a particular piece of software, since that's context here, then REST is fine, but more often than not, we want information in different places. And GraphQL basically addresses the problem of REST APIs often or sometimes send too much and too little. Too much that you always get everything that is known about a resource and too little that you want to also get information about connected resources. And with GraphQL, you can say, I only want the title and the authors and the description, but I also want to get some more information about the authors, their ORCID ID, and then maybe what they have done and so forth. So it basically provides a very flexible way to fetch information from a backend service and display this in a web app or mobile app. So that's the main use case which means it's perfect for many things and horrible for many other things. And um, when you look around, you find that this is widely supported in terms of libraries, discussion, conferences, web pages, et cetera. Some of the more popular APIs, again, relevant for who's attending this conference is GitHub. So their, their latest API is a GraphQL API, not a REST API anymore. And uh, that's a place that sort of, yeah, GraphQL is widely supported uh, when you sort of interact with, with GitHub. And that's sort of the general introduction in a very short version. Um, the sort of scholarly element in this is that it's, I have, I have been working with this for about a year and I have found very, very few people who are also doing this uh, in the context of um, scientific software or scholarly content more broadly, publishers, data repositories, et cetera, which surprises me. Um, but I think there is sort of potential that maybe it's worth um, using this more. And that's sort of one main reason for this workshop that hope that some people attending find this interesting to play with it, learn more, and maybe consider it in one of their uh, next projects. Um, I work for Datasight. Um, what we do is DUIs um, as persistent identifiers and uh, metadata, and we do this with a focus on research data. We have also about 125,000 DUIs for software, basically, 85% of them via Zenodo, and probably most of you know the, the workflow that Zenodo provides. And we are part of a EC funded project where we basically, one main goal is to better connect the various resources. So that's uh, scholarly outputs like research software, data sets, publications. It's actors in this, so it's it's the researchers, it's the institution they work for, it's the funders. And there are many, many connections 
between all those, and they're currently very hard to, to explore, in particular if you want to go sort of more complicated ways in a graph. So not just show me all the papers from a particular person or all the data sets that a particular funder has, has funded, but if, if you want to go a little bit more complex. And um, GraphQL, I think, is a perfect technology for that, and persistent identifiers like DUIs and ORCID IDs and, and so forth are work very nicely with GraphQL because it's sort of the concept of an ID for resource is, is super central, both in how it works in the backend, but also um, if you think of a graph. So that's, that's the six minute introduction. I'm not sure whether this is helpful to get you sort of get this into context, or, and I've, I'm sure we have time for a few questions. Before we move on. There's a question from Will Furness, um, which is basically, why not uh, a REST API? Oh, this What's is the advantages of GraphQL over REST. Um, what you will see in the REST world and is that there are sort of variations of improving REST APIs to be more flexible, that you can say only fetch metadata um, attributes you need, include other things. Data set, for example, for a few years has used something called JSON API, which is, is a weird name. It's basically, if you write this in one word, you find a, a specification how to do stuff. Um, and there's other ways to do this, but I think none of them has really addressed the fundamental problem. Um, so if you need more flexibility in what you get from an API, at some point REST becomes a um, becomes just too complicated. And we have tried this in our project, uh, linking a graph where after we identify the use case, what we want to do, um, we have spent the first six or nine months to sort of stretch our REST APIs to support this. And this just becomes um, at some point quite complicated. Um, something else that sort of I answered the question before it's asked that fits into the space is of course uh, Sparkle and linked data, which also tries to address similar questions. And if you will, um, yeah, this is a, an alternative approach to the kind of question you can ask uh, answer with linked data. The argument there is mostly that this is um, GraphQL doesn't care about your backend services, so it's super flexible. You can use it with relational databases and Elasticsearch and Solar, et cetera. You don't need um, sort of special backend services that are built for um, Sparkle, for example. So I think these, this is a good question, and I would definitely say, and that's also true for, for example, like GitHub, for many, many things, REST is the best solution. There's no way, no need to use GraphQL just because it's cool and fancy. There's another question, um, which is, are there rate limits, and how is the coverage at the moment for the data site graph? Um, so rate limits is mainly that you can make queries that are super complicated in, in terms of while well, traversing the graph, and that would be slow and painful with any service. Uh, and what you can do, for example, I mean, we use the GraphQL library from that GitHub uses, so that's in Ruby. And you can, for example, say the maximal query depth is here because if people go deeper, it, it sort of really puts a lot of load on your API service. The coverage uh, for us, is of course um, scholarly resources with persistent identifiers. What we currently have, and there is queries that we might be able to try uh, in the practical part, is sort of all the data site DOIs, which is uh, close to 20 million. We have started to include CrossWeb DOIs. We have about seven and a half million, but there will be more at the end of the year. We have close to two million from ORCID. Um, and then we have sort of all the identifiers for organizations, which is for so one system to that, all the identifiers for funders, um, and, and a few other things, uh, which is not everything, but it's, it's already millions of resources. And, and we're mainly interested in 
in the connections between them because of the graph aspect. So not just, oh, here's all the people that have an orchid, but we have only the orchids right now that are linked to at least one DOI, meaning one paper, one data set, et cetera. But in terms of scalability, I don't see that this is different from, um, from REST APIs, um, just the complexity of queries, that's the limiting factor. And I see one last um, question in the doc. Um, what are the drawbacks of GraphQL? <laughs> well, what I said earlier, it's new. So it's, I think it's both, it's both cool to work with new technology. And I think in this case, it's sort of mature enough that it's not a fad that goes away in three months. But it's also, of course, uh, yeah. Um, if, you, if you provide an API for the services you have, it, it, it's a lot of work. And there's, of course, a lot of things. And some areas are not as mature as with REST. Um, um, one simple example is error messages. Um, so how to do it. So you spend a lot of time doing the basics again, which maybe if you have worked with REST for years, you have thought you had sort of left behind you five years ago. I mean, you cannot even say status code four or four, or as simple as that is sort of a different mindset. So that's the challenge. So you need to be um, excited and convinced that this actually solves your problems. I'm not so worried about support in the community. There's probably graphical libraries in every major major language, there's enough discussion everywhere from Stack Overflow to dedicated conferences, etc. Any, any other question right now or should we sort of move on? No, I think that's all the questions I see. Okay. Um, so one cool feature of GraphQL is that it's statically typed. And I don't know the mix of people attending this call, but there are just people who love dynamic languages and all the flexibility and maybe the speed that comes with them. And other people just really, really like statically typed languages. And this is here, the schema, how you define things is static. Um, and it's also always done in a standardized way, which means that every single GraphQL API on the planet uh, you can access with a standard client. And there is sort of a very standard client called GraphQL. And the UL I gave you earlier, uh, the data set service that's using a, an open source server uh, that has built in uh, this uh, GraphQL client, which I can, um, quickly share. Uh, unless it sort of decides to not work right now, just like my Zoom. Uh, but that means uh, this makes some things very, very easy um, because it's always the same. Um, so if, if you follow along, you should see in your browser uh, something with a pinkish background um, that allows you to interact with any GraphQL API. So this client is actually just loading in the browser and you can also run it with, with other GraphQL APIs, but here is uh, well, it, it remembers the queries I did previously, and here's one I did. So if you feel like following along, doing some practical stuff, why don't you go there? It's the query language is sort of a flavor of JSON, so it's not totally trivial, but as I will explain to you in a second, there are some tricks uh, or some things that make it easier for you. Um, The first one is that there's a tab on the right side for documentation. And similarly, 
relate to this for the schema, as which I said is aesthetic. So what we can do, for example, uh, in the graph that we have, we want to search for people, which in, in our case means that that's um, uh, people that have an orchid identifier. And what you see is that the query window actually uh, if it works actually sort of does something called autocomplete. So, uh, so it helps you building a, a query. And I think you can do this with your own name if you do this yourself. And I just put in my last name here. Um, I, and let's just see what happens. Okay, so so you see it's complaining because yeah, I'm searching for people, but what do I want to get back? As I said earlier, GraphQL um, basically gives you total flexibility. So in the simplest case, I just want to know well how many people you find with um, with the name Fanner in it, and it's 20. That's not very useful. So let's just say, and that's a special syntax, which is a little bit from graphs. Uh, if you have multiple results, you can use nodes, or you have to use nodes. And we want to see the identifier which is the ORCID ID and the name. So, so now this is the 20 people that have sort of my, also my last name have an ORCID in on our system. And maybe I stop here and you can try to do the same, do this query. Should I paste this in the chat or is that easy enough that you can just type it for yourself if you want to follow along, of course. Yeah, <laughs> if your last name is Smith, there's probably a lot. <laughs> um, um, and yeah, I don't want to go into sort of the query language because that's basically the same as, as in our REST API, for example. That's just a um, variety of things you can do. Um, Oh, and some people are unique, but they probably did know well this before. <laughs> um, if you don't find anything, it basically means you have either not registered with ORCID or you haven't. Um, there's no DUI where the ORCID is in the metadata. We have uh, 120,000 people or so uh, unique um, ORCID IDs that have done as a data site and about 1.5 million in Crossref. So one thing I noticed when I do that is that um, it matches, I have a space in my name and it matches um, across both words in that. So it gives up many more yeah. results. Yeah. So I don't want to go into um, the details of our query parser because it also might need some tweaking. Um, let's see whether first name and last name. So two words that, yeah, that gives me just me. Maybe if you have multiple words, you can do this with an and in between. Uh, the other one would be quotes. Let's see whether I can escape. So quoting the whole thing as full name as a phrase and escaping. So back, backslash to, um, so for people, so for if your last name is Smith or you have too many results or you have weird results because the first name or last name, does this work for you? And maybe let's see whether I can find you, Neil, because I rather use you as an example.
or maybe I wrote you wrong. Nope, it's it's just because when you quote it like that, it's missing the way that my orchid record has it. Oh, oh. <laughs> so what do I need to put in? Um, so if you put in neo p dot chu hong, it should get there. Okay. And oh, and 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 just to be clear. This is not an API call to ORCID, but to a data set service. And the reason is that the ORCID REST API, I hope nobody from ORCID is on this call, is really, really bad. You can do nice queries, but it only returns your ORCID. And if you want to have any additional information, you have to do an API call for that person, which doesn't work for a query. Um, and that's why I, I thought it makes more sense to, to just import the ones that are linked. So now we have Neil and this orchid and now we can do something else uh, so if if you want to look up a specific person you can of course uh, use the identifier and that's the orchid as well in this example and now um, now we're starting to sort of leave the territory where rest brings you Oh, so now it's person, not people, because now we look up a specific record. And now we want to, of course, also, um, for example, well, that's a little bit stupid, given name and family name, which is just to check that we do the right query. which we might not because it's taking some time. Um, but now the interesting part starts now because um, let's combine this with other resources and maybe I can jump to another tab I just had open. Yeah, here. So maybe I need your... So now we want to know not information about the person Neil, but we want to know are there any DUIs from dataset or cross surf associated with your orchid? Um, and Okay, if, if you do that, you see a nice error message, which basically means I'm incapable of copy pasting the orchid. Um, I struggle with that too. <laughs> which is sort of a nicer error message. Than, yeah. um, so, are you, or at least some of you, those who want to follow along, um, doing a query now with person ID colon and then your orchid as well? Does that work for you? Can you quickly paste that into the chat, Martin, and then I'll pop into the document? Sure. So I, I paste the whole query because it's a little bit more complex and maybe that can speed up because we have not so much time left, but ugh. I have to find the chat uh, when I'm sharing the screen. I think so it's now is... up at the top of your screen. Yeah, and I think I just said a chat message to myself, which is an interesting concept, but so is that now you see that? Okay, so this is now, yeah, sort of try to do that with REST. I mean, we, we do that with REST, but it's now you're starting to get into territory where it gets complicated. So um, we can go back to citation count, view count, download code later. So ignore this for now, but now we are looking for works. And I see for Neil, I find 193. 
and this is then also um, faceted, so broken down by year. So two in 2020, but that's okay, beginning of the year, 41 last year. And then the next one is resource type. So we see only one software, but 87 audiovisual, which is probably presentations and 76 data sets. Yeah, so a nice breakdown. And then, then we can have whatever metadata we want for, for each of those. So I decided the title, the DOI and citation count, which seems um, not happening here. Um, so we could say we want additional metadata. And also we could say, wait a second, I don't want all this stuff. I want to query, for example, all the, yeah, everything with the keyword software, which probably is most of this, even if it's, yeah, if it's of type audiovisual. Let's see how that, so we had 193 in total. And if that's, if things are slow for you, then this is because this is a pre-release version where we will release the production version um, later this month. So now I have 158. So you always talk about software, Neil. <laughs> so 80% of your metadata has that in there. Um, something else you have here is a pagination. So there's a default of showing 25 results and you could change that. Um, but now we want more information. And for example, and, and you, when you type this in, you see the autocomplete. So it gives you suggestions of what's available. And I'm interested now, did Neil do all this by himself? Or did he have um, collaborators. So we just include um, that information. I'm not sure whether you are doing the same on your screen or whether you follow along. And if you follow along, whether the screen resolution is good enough. Sort of, are you enjoying yourselves or is it sort of difficult to follow along? I am following can your, along. Can you make your phone a little bit bigger, if possible, if it's easy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can just increase this a little bit. Uh, maybe that's too much. I was following so, along. So now we have sort of the top part is the person, Neil, and then the part that starts with works is um it's sort of a different kind of resource so in rest this would mean you do for example two api calls first this part or this part um and then also we can totally decide what we want and now i added creators which is sort of the data side metadata term for authors and we can see in the first results whether neil worked with other people um, so there's a lot of solo works. Um, here, software papers, improving the usability and usability of scientific software. We have two co-authors who didn't provide their ORCID. Um, this is another version of the same. So you are a, so here's, so here's um, workflows for software citation and discovery in Figshare. And the co-author Dan Katz, who many of you probably know, has also provided this author. Um, but I don't really know what this is. So maybe, maybe I just add a query for the types and because I care about schema.org, I just want 
whatever it is in, in schema.org language, which is another story, but a media object. So it's a presentation that you did together. And, and then there's sort of more things you can add if you care about the something that could potentially work, but I haven't tr never tried it out. And I did enough tweaks in the system in the last few days that I would be suicidal to this now. It would of course be interesting to see, well, what are other um, other outputs of then cats and sort of go one step further in the graph. In theory, you can do this, but this is sort of practically implementing is that sort of um, on a case by case basis because you have to bring all these pieces together. But what we can do is say on Neil's 190 something things, now we only care about his co-authors or co-creators and we just forget the rest. Um, and just query for that, which is basically what we saw that there's a few other people, some of them also with an orchid and then there's sort of, we always need the identifier to sort of follow the, the graph along further because we are not interested in the business of um, doing this sort of with, with algorithms. So there is a, a few co-authors and we could sort of optimize this. Um, but I wanna switch gears for the last few remaining minutes. Uh, so I hope you have learned that the standard GraphQL API um, client uh, allows you to do a lot of things. It's not exactly um, easy because you have to sort of look at the documentation and tweak this, etc. cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's certainly more convenient than working with, an a with a REST API directly where you would just use curl or postman or some tool like that. Um, and most importantly, this, is always the same no matter what GraphQL API I use. It has nothing to do with our specific implementation. Are there um, comments or questions on this part? Did, did everyone, was everybody able to play with this a little bit or was it sort of, did you get stuck somewhere? Maybe I was too fast, for example. Um, I do have a question, Martin, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, first of all. I found this really helpful. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way, this is probably a GraphQL question. Is there a way to go from the list of creators you've just created um, and collect them into a deduplicated list? Oh, oh yeah. Um, which, is, which is basically... Um, the next part where I wanted to go, which is let's move beyond this client. This is a good start, but if you want to do serious stuff, you want to move somewhere else. And that will basically be uh, Jupyter Notebooks is a good next step. And I will talk about this in a moment, which probably already answers your question. If you have a, um, a list of resources, deduplicating them would be a standard activity in a Jupyter Notebook. Mm -hmm especially if you can use identifiers uh, so unique fields and you see for example that neil's name is a little bit different is it it's not the, not his official name there's no p in most of these metadata <laughs> which is the whole point of identifiers uh, other questions for this part okay um you can use our GraphQL client to explore the rest of the web. You can also download 
this as, for example, an Electron app or there's website that provide a client that are generic. So um, that's usually a good start. Um, but for more serious work, um, the next step could be let's do a Jupyter notebook. Um, another example that we've started to use internally at data side where well, this works really well is, is sort of widgets. So little JavaScript snippets that you can embed in a web page and they basically talk to GraphQL API, you decide what you want to display and then this makes it very easy to consume for others. So, um, but Jupyter Notebooks is, is not only a very popular way, but it, I think it's a good match because GraphQL is always the same which means if you write 10 notebooks that do 10 different things, but they all use GraphQL, that the first part, fetching the data and passing them in a format that you want, is always the same. And there isn't really enough time to go in practical examples now because it takes a bit more um, effort. That's the direction we have taken in our um, Freya project. We have started to generate work notebooks. We have done a hackathon a few months ago and we we hope to generate more notebooks um in the coming months which you can then take and for example a notebook that that's basically what we have done here um and then you can do deduplication um, you can also do something and we have a notebook like this that takes all the works from a particular person which might be you and then just formats them into um into a formatted citation using a citation style. And maybe we can just do that here because our GraphQL also supports that, which is um, let's generate a list that is a list of formatted citations. And we actually want to use a particular citation style. My favorite one is APA, but does, you can put whatever supported by citation style language, which is a few thousand. Um, so if you have this GraphQL, you could take this in a Jupyter notebook and do very little work to just format the output in a nice list, which you can then um, make look pretty, etc. cetera. Um, that should be straightforward. This is HTML, so there's also that's why there's sort of um, H, yeah, links and italic, etc. So this would be a very simple example where you could do something uh, in the notebook. The other obvious one is, of course, to visualize a graph. Um, but I'm not sure there is enough time with this. There is a little bit of work needed. GraphQL is about graphs, but getting the edges and nodes out of the output is a little bit of extra work. So I'm not sure how much uh, you are into graphs, but basically the, for example, the, the nodes would be the individual presentations, I guess, from Neil, and, and the edges would be how are they connected. So they are all authored by Neil in this example, and if you want to do a graph, um, that shows that uh, that's easy, but if you also want to show different kinds of connections, then, then you have to spend more effort. Um, but Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so are the, the connections between the nodes uh, annotated? And if so, uh, how do you use them or can you use them? Um, it sort of, again, depends on what you query. So, so here, in this part, before we go to the individual nodes, we are basically, this is sort of an aggregation um, of, of the content. And we could also do, this is a bad example, but um, so for example, when you have, uh, to research outputs, the uh, data set, for example, we support more than 20 types of relations between them. So 
this data set is a new version of that data set or this software was cited by this publication and then um, to make these relation types visible um, you have to do uh, that's where you can sort of ask for specific aspect of connection this is not all implemented because this is uh, yeah becomes quite expensive in terms of API performance. And it's uh, what we have tried to do so far is be driven by use cases, not do everything that's possible. But in theory, the connections are as available to you as the, uh, the nodes, just whatever you want to expose and what query. Okay, thanks. So I think we have five minutes left, which means we should spend the last five minutes for any other questions or comments. And I, I would, for example, be interested in feedback, whether, yeah, that's kind of nice, but who cares? Or that's interesting, or maybe I should look into this uh, again when I have some time. You can also say, this has changed your life, but I would believe you, especially not on April 1st. Uh, this might actually have changed my life because, um, <laughs> if <I'm, laughs> so if, I'm possible, if it's possible for me to, find all software that's been deposited somewhere in a uh, under doi and listed here and can go from there to say github repositories then that would be really helpful i think it's really helpful in general okay so basically for slightly more complex queries where the kind of graphql approach is better than rest um <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'd, other comments? So are you interested in more use cases? Always. Uh, <laughs> we have started so, our BC Funded project collecting use cases. We had about 45. And what we found is all most use cases for the graph, before we talked about technology, is really, it's usually two-step connection. So it's never how is a researcher in Greenland doing social sciences, how can I make connection to someone in Australia who is a, an engineer? That's probably possible, but that's not a use case. Um, so, but what is, your, do you have a specific use case you want to share? So uh, we have conversations about trying to establish a uh, value of a research network, a research network in this case, that's uh, probably two and a half thousand publications over a five year period. So I've ended up with trying to use open tools and do it all as a set of Jupyter notebooks. Um, and uh, I've reached as far as, as disambiguation of about 5 million authors. Um, <laughs> and that's why I want to be sure that you're, uh, my, so my feeling is that we've, we've got quite a bit out of it already, but it is obviously the next step is starting to talk about, you know, correct disambiguation, author IDs where possible, ORCID IDs where possible, and then starting to talk about feeding in some of the more interesting information like policy documents and lots of other things to that. So I'm hoping it will be an ongoing project, but the first time I looked at the, the, the data site GraphQL API, I thought it was really promising, but I'm mm -hmm. also reluctant to throw huge amounts of stuff at something which I think is you know, as you say, is, is kind of coming towards production. Um, no, no, I think, um, no, I'm confident that it's production. Um, things might be slow if you do crazy queries, but this is both stable when we release it with, with the schema will not change. Uh, versioning is a, there's not much time left. Versioning is different in GraphQL. It's a little bit easier than REST APIs. Uh, it's also clear this will be around. We will not turn it off in six months because we said, well, on funding ads. So that's safe. Uh, what I said earlier, but just repeat it. Everything here is built around persistent identifiers, which yeah. makes our lives so much easier. I don't want to get into author disambiguation. That's just, we people do that all the time, but that's not something this can help. But things that have persistent identifiers, um, again, there was not much time, but to show, for example, uh, here is a list of software we find with DUIs, and here's the authors, and here is the things that cite them, uh, something that's not quite ready, but that's also, of course, part of this is showing the different versions. So one use case we identified, I have 20 versions of the software in Zenodo, and not 
everybody cites the same version. So how okay. can I connect, uh, collect everything together? That's a, one of the sort of stronger use cases. So maybe you can think yeah, that part of the work you want to do, this can help, but it's not, yeah, don't throw everything overboard that you've done so far. It's not a yeah, solution to everything. That's cool. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. That's about 5-2. Um, that was a really interesting um, presentation. So I think um, we probably need to close down this room now, and we'll be starting again in the main room at 4 o'clock, and I'm sure people can contribute questions to the Google Doc. Martin, you'll be able to sort of um, take up those answers later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Virtual round. Thanks. Bye.